Our message series is Reveal. And again, as a reminder, we have an outline that goes along with each week's message. Encourage you on Saturday evening or Sunday morning to take the time to print that out. The outline can be found in our weekly ministry update that is sent out by email that you can subscribe to receive on our church website, or you can just go to our church homepage, and there is a button there that allows you to either watch the service or to download the message outline. Well, as I said, our message series is Reveal, and it's all about Jesus and what Jesus and the scriptures reveal to us. Jesus, he is the greatest that has ever lived. There are more paintings painted of him, more songs sung to him, more books written about him. We measure time based upon his life. There is before Christ and then AD, which is a Latin abbreviation for year of our Lord. So reveal. Jesus reveals to us Hope where there is hopelessness. He reveals to us light where there is darkness. And that is why there is so much that is written about him, sung about him, and painted of him. So, with that said, our verse of the month is John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, which speaks to how Jesus is hope and light amidst the darkness. Please join me in reciting these words. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Again, that's John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Well, the beginning. The beginning of the gospel. We're in the first chapter of the gospel of Mark today. But I want to take you, while we're starting at verse 14, the first, read, the first verse of our reading today was verse 14. I want to take you back to verse 1. Here it reads, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the question I want you to ponder here and think about, well, what is the beginning of the gospel? Because when Mark writes this, he's, he's not just saying, well, I'm starting writing now, and this is the beginning of the gospel. And when we get to Mark chapter 16, the end of that gospel that, well, now this is the end of the gospel. No, this whole book, the book of Mark, is the beginning of the gospel. The beginning of the gospel is Jesus. It is Jesus' life, it is Jesus' death, and it is Jesus' resurrection. That is the entire beginning of the gospel. The rest of the story, the rest of the gospel is your story and how you play a part and are invited into Jesus' story. And as we begin the gospel of Mark here in this reading today, Jesus invites the disciples, Peter and Andrew, James and John. He invites them into his story. And just as those first disciples were invited into Jesus' story, so also today, as a follower, as a disciple, you too are invited into the story of Jesus. So let's look at this story. Mark chapter 1, verses 14, starting at verse 14. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God, it is all about new starts. It is all about new beginnings and new opportunities. It is a new way of thinking. It is a new way of doing. It is a new way of relating with others. In a sense, it is a new way of living. It is living in the hope of Jesus. It is living in the light of Jesus. But there are so many things that hold us back from kingdom living. We have all of the excuses that there are in the book. It was once told to me that if you need an excuse, there are any excuse will do. And we have our our share of excuses that hold us back from fully and more completely living for the kingdom. Coronavirus, that's a great excuse, isn't it? How 
how often have you used coronavirus as an excuse in the last year? I'm guilty. I've done it many times. We can't do this. We can't do that. We can't do this. All because of coronavirus. What are some other excuses that we, that we sometimes have? Uh, I'm not qualified. But what's the saying? God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And sometimes you're going to feel like an imposter because you're thinking, well, there should be other people who are doing this. But that's the, that's the devil's lie. Because the, the thing is, is, is anytime we're doing what God has called us to do, it's going to mean we're stepping out of our comfort zone. It's going to mean that we're not going to be quite comfortable being there. And that's how we know that God's got us exactly where he wants us to be. Uh, another excuse that, that we use is, well, I'm, I'm going to fail. And so we don't start. But the thing is, 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 is that we're, we are going to stumble. We are going to, to fail. Many of you have... Uh, probably seen you saw at the countdown video some of the the drone videos that that i've been been filming and, and there's some really great pictures but for here's the thing if any photographer any videographer knows this for every great one picture there's there's a hundred that are horrible it, it it's practice it is repetition and you're going to stumble you're going to fumble you're going to bumble. You're going to use the wrong words. You're going to slip from time to time. In fact, probably more often than, than not. But we keep moving forward anyways. What's another excuse? Well, I've got, I've got too much to learn in order to, to get there. You know, sometimes we, we don't open up our Bibles. Why? Well, because it's such a, a massive book. It's actually 66 books, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the, the New. And, and, you know, we, but we approach it with the mindset, well, we've got to read this in a week. No, just read it one verse at a time, one chapter at a time, one day at a time. And just a little bit every day, you'll be amazed how far you get over the course of a year, over the course of two years, over the course of a a, a decade. It's, it's not a, so much about quantity, but it is about, it is about quality. And I, I'd rather have you contemplate and memorize and take to heart just one single verse of the scripture than to simply read the entire book of the Bible and just kind of have it go over your head. You know, focus on hearing what God has to say. It's not so much about reading the Word of God, but it's about getting that Word of God in you. So, a little bit on a tangent there. Uh, but Jesus says this. He says, the time of the kingdom is now. So stop making excuses for not living more fully for the kingdom. And he goes on to say, repent and believe the gospel. Repent. That's an important word here. And I find this interesting, that these are the first recorded words of Jesus that we have in the Gospel of Mark. And the beginning of the message is, now the time is at hand, repent. He leads with that. Now, repentance, the idea of repentance in our culture, is, it, it's a dirty word, especially in our permissive culture. Because when we hear repent, what we think of, and, and most people think of is, Slap on the wrist. Stop doing bad things. And in this permissive culture, the, the, the mantra is, well, do what, do what you want. Do what makes you happy. Anything goes. But the truth of the matter, if you think this through, if I always did what makes me happy, if I always did what I wanted to do, I'd end up, not being very happy, and not able to do what ultimately I want to do. Think about just eating. If I ate <laughs> when I wanted and what I wanted all the time, I wouldn't eat <laughs> what's good for me. 
And we take that approach with so many things in life. Like what God commands for us in the scripture, it's not for him to be domineering and to lord over us and to hold us back from being who we are made to be. No. He commands us what he commands us for our own good. We need to understand that repentance is, is not a dirty word. It is, in so many ways, it is a beautiful, beautiful word. It's, it's about change. It's about new direction. It is about setting aside the old and embracing the new. It's to stop blaming Blaming God, it's to stop blaming others for the predicament that you find yourself in and ultimately to take personal responsibility over my choices and my actions and to follow Jesus in life. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, it says in verse 16, he saw Simon, who later he would give the name Peter, Petros, the rock, and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. The thing I love about this is that it was not Simon and Andrew who went to Jesus, but rather it was Jesus who met Simon and Andrew where they were. That's the thing about God. He meets us where we are at. We tend to compartmentalize different parts of our lives and our faith. We have our, our careers, we have our family, and we have church over here. We have all of these little different compartments in, in life. And sometimes we hear, well, we're going to put Jesus first in our life. And that's all well and good, but Jesus wants to be more than just first in our life. He wants to be every part of our life. He, he doesn't want to be just part of your life one hour on a Sunday morning, but he, he wants to be a part of your relationships. He wants to be a part of, of your marriage. He wants to be a part of your career. He wants to be a part of your finances. He wants to be part of the way in which you manage your calendar and your time. He doesn't want to be part of your life. He wants to be a part of every part of your life. So Jesus says this. He sees the brothers casting their nets, and he says to them, follow me, and I will make you what? I will make you fishers of men. Some of you may find yourself dissatisfied in different areas and different parts of your life. And just maybe, just maybe, the reason that you're dissatisfied, the, the, one of the things we hear all the time is, well, how you doing? I'm busy. And, and that's sort of our in many ways, it, being busy makes us feel important. And being busy leads to being too busy. And maybe the reason that you're too busy is because rather than following Jesus with your calendar, you're trying to impress others by all that you are doing. So Jesus says, you know, don't follow the way of the world. Come and follow me. And when you follow me, you're going to experience greater things. You're not just going to catch fish. But Jesus is saying to the disciples here, you're going to catch others. And others are going to follow you. The greatest movement in all of history was begun right here in this moment. You know, we're standing here today as the church because of that simple invitation that Jesus gave to Simon and Andrew and James and John to come and follow me. And again, that's an invitation that Jesus has given to you today to follow him in every area of your life. On the outline here, I have Savior and Lord. And Jesus is Savior and he is Lord. And first and of most importance, we need to know that he is the Savior. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your doing. It is the gift of God, not the results of work so that no one can boast. Your salvation is not because you were a follower of Jesus. Your salvation is not because you commit every area of your life unto him. 
Your salvation, your eternal life is based upon the beginning of the gospel. What Jesus did for you, his life, his death, and his resurrection. That is what makes Jesus to be the Savior. And the moment you come to faith, the moment you believe in him as Lord, is the moment that that gift of salvation is imparted and given to you. There is a theological term that we sometimes use, and you'll see it in the book of Romans, justification. Your justification before God comes as a result of not anything that you have done. It's solely because of what Jesus has done for you. That's justification. But we need to recognize that Jesus is not just the Savior. Let's set that aside for a moment. Jesus is Savior, and he is Lord. And the disciples here, Simon and Andrew, it says that immediately, when Jesus gives this the invitation to follow him, it says immediately they left their nets and they followed, they followed him. They didn't hesitate. They left everything behind. Their old way of being, their old way of living, their old way of relating. And certainly moving forward, there would be bumps along the way. No doubt. And there were some major bumps actually along the way. But Jesus here in this moment invited them into a whole new life. It was a whole new beginning. It was a life of significance. It was a life that was filled with with joy and all the fruit of the spirit it was a life that was worth living we sang that in the early in our song build your kingdom here we don't want to waste our lives here upon this earth but we want to live a life that is significant and the way to do that is through kingdom living it is through following jesus i have a on the outline there's a chart i want you just to give yourself a short evaluation. And uh, the, the chart is, there's the illustration here is the idea of driving. And when, you, when you're in the driver's seat, you make all the choices, you make all the decisions, you go where you want to go. And so the question here is, are you the one in the driver's seat here? Are you going where you want to go? Or... The opposite of that is, well, I put Jesus in the driver's seat. He's the one driving the car, but you know what? I'm sitting in the back seat, and I'm watching what he's doing. And I'm making sure to tell him to go where I want him to go. Jesus is not necessarily the driver. He's more like your chauffeur, (laughs) helping you to get where you want to get. But ultimately, the invitation that Jesus gives is not for us to drive the car, not for us to be the backseat drivers, but for, to let him do the driving and him to take us where he wants to take us. So where are you? Where are you on that continuum? Are you calling the shots? Or have you laid down your life and given your life to Jesus to allow him to do and have his way and to do what he would do. Here's the thing. You're here. You're not totally doing all the driving. I know that. You wouldn't be watching if that was the situation. At the same time, we all have hang-ups. We all have areas of our lives where we are insisting on holding on to control and fail to release it to the Lord. So as a, as a homework assignment, before we go here today, my encouragement to you is, is what is that area? What is that area of your life where you're holding on? where you have failed to turn it over and commit that area of your life fully and completely to Jesus, to follow him in every way, wherever that is, even if it is someplace uncomfortable. And I want you to consider, well, how might I more fully follow Jesus? How may I let Jesus meet me 
in that area of my life and more fo- fully follow him. Again, maybe it's in a relationship in parenting. Maybe it is in a relationship as your, your marriage or a friendship. Maybe it's in, in your career. Uh, maybe it's just simply in the way that you're spending your money. Or maybe it's in the way that you're scheduling and prioritizing your time. Think through the different areas of your life and just ask that simple question. Where am I going where I want to go? And where here am I following Jesus? And where is there room for me to more fully follow Jesus? Let me pray for you here today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and your goodness. I thank you for the beginning of the story, your life, your death, your resurrection, and the hope that we have to know that we have eternal life that moment we believe. We pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage to follow you uh, in each and every area of our lives. And that, Lord, as we contemplate, as we ponder and consider in our own personal devotion time and prayer, that you would open our eyes and give us insight to see, Lord, that which you would have us see. Meet us where we are at. Give us that invitation to come and follow you that we might live just as your disciples lived as fishers of men, that we might live with greater significance. We pray this all in Jesus' precious and holy name and all God's people said, amen.